Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new video of Bold Sky Three. In this episode, I'm going to share my Mistra cleric build. Mistra is the goddess of magic, a neutral good deity, and another goddess heavily involved in the incident of Bold Sky Three. She is the overseer of the weave, which is the source of magic in Faerun's world setting. It's pretty natural for her clerics to have a wizard background, right? So here comes this build of mine. Mistra has two domains, Arcana and Knowledge. Since Arcana domain is not playable in both Sky Three, I chose Knowledge domain for this build. I think Knowledge domain cleric is among the least played subclasses in the game. Its core abilities have nothing to do with combat, and for the few control spells it gets from the domain, there is always another subclass that can do way better than it. Well, all of these are true. It's not meant for combat. But that doesn't make it a bad subclass because a knowledge domain cleric can be really powerful outside of combat. This build is a sage alchemist kind of setting. It's an ultimate skill check and utility build, and it works as a full-time supporter in combat. It has two levels of knowledge domain cleric, nine levels of transmutation wizard, and one level of rogue. With the knowledge domain and the rogue class, it's almost a free pass for all the skill checks outside of combat, giving you amazing freedom to steer the story to the direction you want. Let's have a look here. This is the skills of a normal person. You can only do a few things, and not really good in some of them. And this is the skills of this build. You can cover all the intelligence and wisdom skill checks. One of the charisma checks of your choice. And check for picking locks and disarming traps, and you are good at all of them. And you can cast the cleric cantrip guidance on yourself to get another 1d4 bonus when actively making a check, making you even better. These are pretty much all the checks you need to worry about outside of combat. Difficult locks and traps, no problem. Understanding magic, no problem. Recalling history, no problem. Solving mysteries, no problem. Understanding nature, no problem. Understanding religions and the deities, no problem. Getting on good terms with animals, no problem. Detecting lies, no problem. Identifying poisoned drinks, no problem. Noticing hidden things, no problem. Discovering resources, no problem. Persuading bosses to kill themselves, not really hard. This can be amazing on tabletop. So here is how we make this happen. First, at the knowledge domain level one, we get the ability Blessings of Knowledge. This allows you to get a proficiency bonus in two of four intelligence skills, and then automatically get expertise in each of the two. Proficiency is a plus two bonus at level one. It becomes plus three at level five, and eventually plus four at level nine. And expertise allows you to double the bonus you get from proficiency. That means we can get a plus four bonus right at the beginning of the game. The four skills you can choose from are Arcana, History, Nature, and Religion. In this build, we choose Nature and Religion. Then, by choosing Sage as our background, we get proficiency in Arcana and History. Then, by studying in the Wizard class, we can choose to get proficiency in Investigation, covering all the Intelligence skills. As for the other one from the wizard class, choose whichever you like. They can all be covered later. Then, at knowledge domain level two, we get the ability knowledge of the ages. This is a channel divinity action that allows you to get proficiency in all the skills of an ability score. Its effect lasts a whole day, so we only need to cast it at the beginning of a day. We will be using this to get proficiency in all the wisdom skills. Then, by choosing human as our race, we get the ability human versatility. This allows you to get another proficiency in one skill of your choice, making human the perfect race for this build. Finally, human is good for something. For this build, we will choose one from the charisma skills. This pretty much determines what kind of a story you are gonna create. If you want a old-time classic good character, choose persuasion. If you want a trickster, choose deception. If you want a frightful character, choose intimidation. Usually, when you need to make a charisma check in a conversation, these three always show up together. So you only need one of them, and this covers charisma for us. Then, by getting one level in rogue, we can get proficiency in sleight of hand. Besides, we can get expertise in two from all the skills we already have proficiency in. First, we choose sleight of hand to better handle difficult locks and traps. Then we choose the charisma skill to make up for the lack of ability score. 
Thus, we've covered all the skills we need. Besides these skill checks, this field gets all kinds of utility abilities from wizard spells and potions. This is how fabulous it is outside of combat. Then, in combat, this build is gonna be a full-time supporter. The core spell we all rely on is the level 1 cleric spell, Bless. It gives the target a 1d4 bonus to attack rolls and saving throws, making them stronger both on the offense and defense. This will be the spell we concentrate on in every battle. When cast at level 1, it targets 3 units, and when not cast, it can target one more unit for every level increased. And if you include yourself in the target, this spell protects its own concentration. This is the first boost we give to the whole team. Then, at the Transmutation Wizard level 2, we get the ability Experimental Alchemy. This allows you to produce twice as many end products when you do alchemy, as long as you succeed a medicine ability check. With this, your party can have a huge stock of potions, weapon coatings, and elixirs. The best of them are the elixirs. Each elixir is a buff that lasts a whole day, but each person can only benefit from one elixir each day. Let me introduce the ones I like to use. Elixir of Peerless Focus. It gives you advantage on concentration safety throws and against being charmed. It also gives you immunity to magical sleep. This is the elixir I use on this build to protect the concentration on Bless. Then, elixir of heal giant strength. It increases your strength to 21. This is the one I give to my frontline tanks so that they have maximized attack rolls and weapon damage right from the early game. There is a stronger version called elixir of cloud giant strength. It increases your strength to 27. You can start to craft the stronger one starting from the mid game. Then, Elixir of Arcane Cultivation. It gives you an extra spell slot. The higher the Elixir's level, the higher the spell slot. This is the one I give to my damage casters so that they can throw more spells each day. Then, Elixir of Battle Mage's Power. It increases your spell attack rolls and spell DC by 3. This is the one I give to my DC casters to make it harder for the enemies to evade their spells. But this one can only be crafted later in the game. These elixirs are the second boost we give to the whole team. Besides the elixirs, there are two utility potions that last the whole day. The first is Potion of Animal Speaking. It allows you to talk to animals. The other is Potion of Mind Reading. It allows you to detect people's thoughts. You can start crafting these two pretty early. And since you are a transmutation wizard, you don't need to worry about them running low. I give this build one of each of them every day. Speaking of this, let me explain how alchemy works and share a few tips here. First, you need to combine three of the same raw materials into an ingredient. Then, you need to combine ingredients into an end product. One of the ingredients needs to be a specific one, the other can be any from the same category. Don't trust the system to allocate them automatically. It sometimes wastes ingredients that are required for other precious items. Instead, always check here and manually choose less valuable ones. The other thing is, don't craft too many at once, especially for elixirs. You may unlock better things as you progress, or you may change your build, so crafting too many at once may waste your money and precious ingredients. The only exceptions are healing potions and the potion of speed. You can never have too many of them. As for where to get the ingredients, you can get a lot when exploring, so don't forget to check every corner wherever you go. And some merchants sell certain ingredients, remember to buy all of them. Their stock will recharge after your long rest, so don't forget to pay them a visit every day. They will also unlock ingredients for better potions as you level up. And now that we have mentioned healing potions, this is another thing this build will be doing in combat. Throw in potions to heal allies or cure them of conditions. By doing this, you can make these potions more effective. That's because when a unit drinks a potion, it only affects that unit. But when you throw a potion, it becomes a small AoE. You can use one potion to heal usually two allies at once. And healing potions will not be the only thing you throw. You can throw bombs to deal AoE damage. You can throw poisons to control the enemies. You can throw things like grease bottles to outer terrains. You can throw water to clean the floor. Whenever something needs to be thrown, you can do that. 
The good thing about not having any combat action is that you have the time to throw all these fabulous items, like an alchemist would do. Of course, other characters can do this too, but that means they have to stop doing what they do better. And it's hard to know which character is gonna need to throw what at what time, so it's impossible to plan ahead and allocate the items. But with this build dedicated to supporting, problem solved. You can store all your throwable items on this character. Again, this makes a human the perfect race for this build, because the ability Human Versatility also increases your carrying capacity by a quarter. Okay, besides alchemy, at the Transmutation Wizard level 6, we get the ability to create a Transmuter Stone. The Constitution Stone can give us proficiency in Constitution saving throws. This will help us maintain concentration on Bless. And besides all this, this build also gets some nice protective spells from both Cleric and Wizard classes. For example, Sanctuary. This spell grants the target an almost absolute protection. The affected unit cannot be targeted, which means enemies cannot attack them with single target actions. This effect will end when the target attacks anyone. Then there is Counter Spell from the Wizard class. This allows you to completely negate an enemy spell as a reaction. Counter Spell can negate any spell whose level is not higher than the spell slot you spent. If the spell's level is higher, you still get a chance to negate it, but you need to make an ability check. And since you don't use your spell slots to attack, you have a lot of them reserved for these protections. So, these are all the things this build can do, the embodiment of versatility. Now, let's see the equipment you'll be searching for. First, anything that increases your ability scores should be a priority, because the higher they are, the better you are at your skills. Then, anything that enhances your skills is welcomed. The ones that enhance your support spells are also nice to have. And then, the ones that increase saving throws or prevent conditions are also important, because you are the one curing others, and you cannot do that if you are controlled yourself. Okay, now let's talk about the leveling strategy, when to level into each class, and what you can do in different stages of the game. We start this build with the Wizard class. When originally allocating ability scores, we give the major bonus to Wisdom and bring it up to 17, which is the highest possible for now. We'll eventually get it to 20. This is to maximize our chance to craft twice the alchemy products. It's also the ability for our cleric cantrip attacks, and it also makes you hard to control by the most powerful control spells in the game. And since we start as a wizard, we have proficiency in wisdom saving throws. So our effective wisdom will be even higher than 20 when making saving throws. Then we give the minor bonus to charisma and make it 11. We'll later take it to 12. We will have an expertise for the charisma check, so this one can afford to be lower than the others. Then, we bring intelligence to 14 for the intelligence skill checks. Since we have proficiency in all the intelligence skills, 14 is already good enough. Then, we forego 2 strength to bring dexterity to 14. This is to increase our sleight of hand skill check, as well as our initiative rolls and AC. 14 dexterity alone doesn't give much AC, but this build will be wearing medium armor, so its collective AC is still good enough for a backline character. We leave Constitution unchanged at 10. Normally, this will make us bad at maintaining concentration. But for this build, we get an advantage from the Elixir of Peerless Focus and the proficiency from Transmuter Stone, so we will still be pretty good at maintaining it. This is also where you start choosing skill proficiencies. Remember to allocate one of your wizard proficiencies to Investigation, and allocate your human proficiency to the Charisma skill you want. And also, choose Sage as your background for proficiency in Nakana and History. For the wizard cantrips, we are gonna choose three utility cantrips. There is no point in choosing anything offensive, because wizard uses intelligence to cast the spells, and we are not gonna land many offensive spells with 14 intelligence. First, we choose Friends to better enhance our Charisma skill check. This cantrip gives you an advantage in Charisma checks. Then we choose Light. This cantrip can make an object shine and illuminate the surroundings. Then we choose Mage Hand to manipulate things from a distance. For the wizard starting spells, first we choose Mage Armor 
a must-have for any wizard who doesn't wear armor. It sets your AC to 13, which is already higher than most light armors. This build needs to reach level 2 to be able to wear medium armor, so before that we need to cast this spell. Then we choose Shield. It's another must-have for any wizard build. It's a reaction that gives you another 5 AC when you need it, making you harder to be hit. Remember to untoggle your opportunity attack in case you withdraw reaction on that and can't cast your protection reactions. Then we choose Long Strider, a must-have for any party. It increases the target's moving distance for the whole day without concentration, as long as the spell is still prepared. And it's a ritual spell, which means if you cast it outside of combat, it doesn't consume your spell slot. Then we choose Enhance Leap and Feather Fall. These two spells combined give your party more freedom when exploring. They are ritual spells too. Then we choose Find Familiar. This allows you to summon a creature into your party to help with combat and exploring. Once summoned, they'll be there until their hit points get reduced to zero. It's a ritual spell, and summon spells don't need to stay prepared once the creature is summoned. Wizard class also gives you the ability Arcane Recovery. You can recover a combined level of spell slots that is less than or equal to half your wizard level rounded up. From level 2 to level 3, we'll be leveling up in the Cleric class to get more skill proficiencies as soon as possible. Starting from this level, we can wear medium armor and stop casting mage armor. Right at Cleric level 1, we can choose into the Knowledge Domain and get the ability Blessings of Knowledge to get proficiency and expertise in nature and religion. Now we have covered all the intelligence skills. Level 1 is also when Clerics choose their deities. You get exclusive interactions in the story for the deity you chose, and sometimes there is more to that. For this build, of course, I'm choosing Mistra here. Bolter's Gate 3 doesn't limit your choice of deity, you can choose any deity regardless of your domain. But in classic D&D 5e rules, a cleric can only choose a domain that their deity has. If you don't want to play Mistra, there are three other knowledge domain deities available in the game. The first one is Saluna, the goddess of moon. Her domains are knowledge, life, and twilight. Her alignment is chaotic good. The second one is Ogma, the god of knowledge. He is a deity commonly worshipped by bards and scribes. He only has one domain, which is knowledge, and his alignment is completely neutral. The third one is Moradin, the dwarf god of creation. His domains are forge and knowledge, and his alignment is lawful good. For the cleric cantrips, first we choose Guidance. This is your core spell offset of combat. Whenever you actively make a skill check, cast this on yourself. Whenever you do alchemy after you get a transmutation wizard subclass, cast this on yourself. Whenever a teammate needs to make a skill check, cast this on them. This spell makes your exploration and conversations much easier. Then we choose Sacred Flame. It's a ranged radiant damage country. This will be our default attack. Then we choose Produce Flame. This gives you a ranged fire damage option, and it can be used to burn things when exploring. For the Cleric starting spells, we can prepare four. First, we choose Bless, our core spell in combat. Then, we choose Sanctuary, to protect the team member in dangerous situations. Then, we choose Healing Word and Cure Wounds. Both of them are healing spells. Cure Wounds heals more, but it takes a standard action, and it's a melee spell. Healing Word only takes a bonus action and can be cast at a distance. These two spells can be nice to use in the early game, but later in the game, we'll rely on throwing potions to heal, because without being in the life domain, our healing spells will not be efficient enough, and thus not worth the spell slots. At level 3, we get the ability Knowledge of the Ages. Now we can cast it every day to get proficiency in all the wisdom skills. Besides this, all clerics get the ability Turn Undead at level 2. It can force all undead creatures around you to flee if they fail a saving throw. This is a nice control when fighting undead enemies. Both this ability and Knowledge of the Ages are Channel Divinity abilities. You only have one charge of Channel Divinity, but it recharges every short rest, so you still have two shots for this ability each day after the first short rest. At this level, we can also prepare one more Cleric spell. 
we choose Create or Destroy Water. It's a nice spell for utility and terrain altering. At level 4, we choose into the Rogue class to get a proficiency in the sleight of hand skill and to get expertise in both it and the charisma skill. Now we can start picking locks and we are good at it, and we become better in conversations. Starting from level 5, we are stick to the wizard class to get our spells and feats. At level 5, we get to choose into the transmutation school and can start producing twice as much stuff through experimental alchemy. I recommend you only start doing alchemy from here, don't use any ingredient before this. At this level, we can also learn two more utility spells. First, we choose Disguise Self. This allows you to assume a false identity, which can be useful in places where a certain race has benefits. And again, it's a ritual spell. Then, we choose Thunder Wave. This can be used to move heavy objects. At level 6, we can learn and prepare the spell See Invisibility. This is one of the best abilities of a wizard. It lasts a whole day and doesn't need concentration, but you do need to keep it prepared. We also get to learn Knock. This spell can unlock any lock, no matter its difficulty class, unless the story forbids it. At level 7, we get to choose our first feat. Here, we choose Ability Improvement to bring our Wisdom to 18 and our Charisma to 12, giving them both another plus one modifier. At this level, we can also learn and prepare the spell Dark Vision. This is important for human because human cannot see far in dark places. Without this, it will be hard for you to do ranged actions. This spell works similarly to see invisibility. It lasts a whole day and doesn't need concentration, but you do need to keep it prepared. Besides, we also choose to learn Chromatic Orb. We can use this spell to deal certain types of damage to trigger certain effects. At level 8, we can learn and prepare the spell Counter Spell. Now, we can start negating enemy spells to protect our team. We also choose to learn Remove Curse to better protect our allies. This spell can also be useful sometimes in the story. At level 9, we can learn and prepare the spell Misty Step. It is useful both inside and outside of combat by teleporting for quite a distance, and it only takes a bonus action. We also choose to learn Gust of Wind, another useful utility spell. We can use it to clear harmful smokes. At this level, we can also start creating transmuter stones. Now, we can create the constitution stone for ourselves and get the proficiency in constitution saving throws. At level 10, we can learn the spell Conjure Minor Elemental to summon another unit for our party, which is recommended for any mage build. We also choose to learn Dimension Door. This spell can teleport you plus an ally near you. At level 11, we can choose our second feat. Here, we choose Ability Improvement to increase our Wisdom to 20 the cap. At this level, we also finally have the luxury to learn and prepare the spell False Life. This spell gives you some temporary hit points. This effect lasts a whole day as long as you don't take damage and lose those hit points, so you only need to cast it at the beginning of the day. Upcasting this spell gives you more temporary hit points, but I only cast it with a level 2 slot. The higher slots are reserved for more important spells. At level 12, we can learn the spell Conjure Elemental to summon a stronger unit for our party. This is a level 5 spell, but at this level, we already have a level 6 spell slot. So, we can upcast this spell to summon the stronger unit. Okay, we have talked about how good this build is. Now, let's talk about its weaknesses. I think this build's weakness is pretty obvious. You definitely cannot solo anywhere, and you definitely cannot fight a battle alone. You always need a team, but as long as you have a well-balanced team, you can do a wonderful job supporting them. The other thing is that you rely heavily on consumable items. Although this gives you great versatility and you can have a huge stock due to experimental alchemy, but in the end, these things are finite at any given time. If you fight too many battles, you will run out of precious resources. This is even more so in honor mode because it's harder to get money and things are more expensive. For this reason, it's very important for you to avoid combat and try to solve things in other ways. And this build is good at that. This is how I use it to survive honor mode. Use it to make your team grow peacefully and save resources without spending things in unnecessary fights so that you can be more prepared for the unavoidable tough fights. 
Anyway, be creative, like Sage would do. I had a lot of fun doing this. And that is everything about this Mistral rebuild. Hope you like it. If you like this video, please click the like button and subscribe to my channel. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye.